Greetings everyone, Andy Dukes here again. Welcome to Ride and Talk. Ever thought about doing your own custom build? Or getting your own customised BMW one day? Well, prepare to be inspired by the legendary Danny Weidman from VTR Customs. This guy's been building bikes all his life. And you'll be familiar with some fantastic R90s that have come out of the VTR stable. As well as the infamous fire-breathing Spitfire that's blasted onto the sprint scene several years ago. There are many more super interesting builds, and we discuss a few of the highlights here, including Miss Fisher, a unique R18 inspired by a TV detective series in a Swiss vintage car from the 1920s. I guess it doesn't matter where you get your inspiration from when the results are this good. So listen up, learn and be inspired by Danny Weidman, who I caught up with at his workshop in Switzerland. Well, welcome to Ride and Talk, Danny. It's an honour to have you on the podcast, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I feel honour. I've been wearing a small Swiss uh, village here, so I feel honoured to be a guest here, really. That's uh, something new and strange to me. Well, we'll see how you feel after I've bombarded you with uh, 150 <laughs> questions. But, I mean, where where do we start, Danny? I guess we better start with you, because I've seen some amazing BMW bikes coming out of the VTR Customs Garage, well, ever since the R9T broke cover in 2013. But you've been designing and building unique machines for much longer than that. Where did it all begin for you? I read somewhere that you've been working on bikes since you're about six years old. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, some, somehow uh, it's about genes, I think, in my blood. So uh, the whole customization actually started when I was five years old. So my dad, he owned a car painter shop. And so I got all these small toy cars, matchbox. And of course, I was eager for the race uh, cars like a BMW 3.0 CS, uh, Group C, blah, blah, all this kind of stuff. But um, I think they don't look like, like they should look. So the, the painters in my dad's shop, they had to repaint my matchbox cars in the design I'd like to have. That was step one with five years. And then uh, I started with uh, bicycles doing motocross. Uh, uh, first challenge was all the frames. They were broken after some of the higher jumps. So... <laughs> Uh, I added uh, a fork from a motorcycle on the front fork, so I covered that problem, and so on and so on. So this is kind of, uh, yeah, as a kid, that it, somehow that started uh, that way. And there was always plenty of stuff lying around f for you to fix things or modify things or to basically try things out, experiment, I guess. Yes, and, and as uh, some of my clients making it uh, as fast as possible, which... <laughs> Somehow, and so at a certain point of time, you have some challenges with police, especially in Switzerland. So I remember the, the first uh, very fast uh, motor bicycle I had was kind of modified and tuned up uh, like hell. So police caught me. And then at that time, um, to kind of making, making it a learning session for the kids, you had to go to the police station, you had to remove all the parts who, are, who were not allowed and you had to crash them with a big hammer in front of the policeman. So, oh, so they make, a, make an example of you. Yeah, an educational program uh, didn't help too much. They caught me three times in a row. So, <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And that's where it all started. And of course, that means you've been doing it around 50 years uh, so far and yeah, still going yeah. strong. Yeah. Now, VTR, it's the custom arm of the BMW Motor deal of VTR Motorrad. How did this side of the business actually develop then, Danny? Uh, I did several things in my professional life. Started as a motorbike technician, but then was with banks and the airline industry and so on. However, I was facing some challenges with my latest position. I was working in St. Moritz, a winter tourism destination as a BMW car seller. But I didn't see any kind of uh, future uh, up there. So uh, I discussed with my wife what's next. Staying St. Moritz and uh, selling Audis or Mercedes was not really an option for me. And then uh, kind of uh, going back to my roots, back to motorcycle business. Uh, and then I called up a friend of mine. We know each other from the Supermoto Racing uh, Series. We, we raced together. And I said, hey... Um, 
look, why shouldn't we do that together? So we find Stucki Zweirad at that point. They had no inheritance uh, successor uh, on the radar. And so that's how uh, we started buying Stucki Zweirad. And at that time, that was about 2014, um, there was not much uh, out there on the BMW customization. So from the first day on, I knew that we we go th that road uh, to be ahead of the bulk. And since, uh, as we mentioned, my lifetime, I changed bicycles, cars, bikes. I never owned a standard uh, vehicle. So everything is customized. So we started right away with uh, customization. And lucky we, uh, that's that was the date when the 90 came out. Absolutely brilliant, yeah. And and you mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, you were racing. I think you you've raced uh, motocross and and supermoto, as you said. So, I think one of the builds or, or the build that you're most famous for internationally is the Spitfire. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I guess it made sense for you to build a racing bike, albeit one for sprint racing. Um, I've also read somewhere that this this amazing bike was inspired by your past as an aircraft mechanic or yeah. pilot. Some is that correct? Yeah, that's you, correct. You, missed, you, you missed that out of your uh, previous description of your uh, <laughs> career progression. Yeah. So the basic design idea was uh, came by a sketch um, Barbara Design. That's a design studio in France. They dis they just do sketches from bikes, really nice, nice bikes. And I saw this sketch, and from that moment I knew that uh, what the bike should look like. I worked as an aircraft technician uh, for a Swiss airline about ten years long, and as a side job I helped uh, an owner of a World War Two aircraft to maintain his bike. So every year you have to do an annual check, blah blah, and. Uh, Kind of as a payment, I was able uh, to fly that bike too. So that was a nice deal we had there. And due to that history or my personal uh, impressions, I knew exactly what the fuselage should look like uh, from an airplane. And I remember that plane that was a North American Troyon uh, 28B. Uh, uh, when firing up that engine, there were two meter flames out of the exhaust. So that's that was the trigger point to say okay let's build spitfire and let's make it spit fire and that's why the the bike uh, looks like this and is famous for his flamethrower <laughs> absolutely now i'll come back because I, I wanted to ask you a question about that in a minute but just going back to that design you said that you saw a sketch so did did the concept to, you know develop entirely your in your head after seeing that sketch or because i've heard you don't use sort of any computer-aided techniques in your production did you just do the whole thing from the sketch and the ideas that that gave you then yeah that's uh that's true uh, we don't have any uh photoshop or 3d animation we don't work with the cad programming we do it by hand and we're pretty proud that all the alloy work we do here in our shop, uh, Cello is doing that. And so that's uh, a very uh, influential progress where designing such. We know how it should look like. And then in the critical phases, Cello is, is asking me, Danny, come and show me <laughs> what you like to do. We discuss the lines. We say no uh, flatter on the front, higher on the rear. So it's really freehand freestyle and, until uh, it gets the shape we all wanted to. And the Spitfire was probably the bike Cello almost killed me. So uh, it took about four, four or five months to build that bike. And at the end, I get the feeling if I say one more time, uh, let's do the shape there a bit different, he's going to kill me right away. So. <laughs> I can believe it. I can believe it. I mean, I just love that aluminium. Mm. You mentioned the fuselage, that style, that riveted bodywork and, and how low the overall bike is. But of course, like a lot of racing bikes, that, that bodywork covers some really lovely engineering modifications. Mm. So I'm sure that there must be a massive amount of interest whenever the bikes close, whenever the bodywork comes off at shows and events because people want to see you know how you lowered the forks what you've done to the rigid rear end uh, you know i believe the bike just sits about 90 centimeters high um in total so when you take the clothes off when you take that bodywork off do you get a lot of interest as to what's underneath yeah that was an interesting experience when we first showed the bike in monza 
So we unloaded and then uh, a crowd of people came along to see the bike. And then for technical control and inspection, you have to remove the body parts because they have to seal the fuel injection uh, and things like that because there are rules and regulation in this factory clause. And then uh, we had even more people around that bike to look underneath uh, of the bodywork. Uh, one of the biggest challenges was actually something we didn't had on our radar was the front fork because the rules and regulation, they say you must have a minimum of three centimeters front fork travel. Now, uh, taking an R1200 R fork and shorten it by 30 centimeters is already a challenge, but this, <laughs> this freaking 30 centimeters were not enough, so we had to go lower again. And that was uh, one of the bigger challenge actually we had with Spitfire. Wow, yeah. I mean, just taking 30 centimetres up is incredible yeah. <laughs> in the first place, yeah. But actually having to do that on the fly. Now, apologies if you've answered this question a hundred times, but I did say that I'd come back to uh, the spit fire and spitting fire, mm-hmm. which, of course, which is what the uh, the tailpipes literally do. Was that idea there from the beginning, or was it a moment of inspiration over a whiskey and a cigar with friends one night to, to actually make that happen? No, that was actually from the first moment. I knew that it must spit fire and uh, it should be called spit fire. Uh, Funny enough, the the most comments or some of the bad comments I got from the bike was uh, that no respect for World War II. So you have a German air, uh, a German bike with the British uh, name. And uh, so that's... uh, these kind of comments we, we got. So, uh, and the best answer to that one was what the one from Bike Exif. He said, it's even worth, there is a, a Dutch, a Dutch uh, sponsor and Swiss engineering underneath, but thanks God, we are all friends now in Europe. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's an old expression, isn't it? You can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. But uh, can you briefly explain how it works then, you know, with a control unit and how the fuel spray is actually activated? Because uh, I believe it's from a switch on the cockpit or something like that. Yeah, that's true. Actually, we take the, the regular fuel we, we use for the bike anyway. Uh, you have already a fuel pump in mind, so you just uh, make a second fuel line there. And then in the exhaust itself, we have an igniter plug, uh, which we control with the separate switch. The thing sounds sounds very easy and very logical. We spent hours to make this fire uh, coming out. And I remember the day when we started to testing it uh, here in the workshop. Uh, we did several hours because the... The, the challenge is you have very high air speeds coming out of the exhaust, then you have fuel. But as we all know, you need a certain mixture of air and fuel. So <laughs> the freaking flame didn't fire up. We just blew out tons of fuel. We all smelled like a fuel dealer or like having a shower <laughs> under a fuel nozzle. And when we came home, every wife was the same comment. Are you not still? Had you, have you had uh, fuel as a, as a drink or did you party with fuel? So, uh, yeah, sounds very easy. Uh, getting his work was not that easy. Yeah, but you've got to make a lot of mistakes to make something special, have you? I think Amelie is best known for uh, actually racing this bike. How nervous was she the first time when you were showing her how to uh, activate and use that system? <laughs> the, the first challenge was when she saw the bike in real the first time. Then we, we made her sit on the bike to see if she's even able to touch the handlebars because the bike is very, very long on the front end. So she was able <laughs> uh, to sit. And then uh, the first test rides I did by myself and then... Uh, off we go and she sat on the bike and uh, then we just were practicing a little bit the starting procedure in eight mile business that's uh, that's all you need is a very fast start and the bike is very tricky to to go fast and to have a fast start so there we're practicing a little bit on a closed airfield and on on other tracks but she is uh, uh, proud and uh, gearhead as we are. She sat on the bike and just loved it. And uh, st- then we started. The second challenge was to turn the bike at the end of the eight mile. 
So it has really, really limited steering angle because of the fancy design we had in mind. And then we already uh, started uh, sketch some special tools to turn the bike at the end of the racetrack and to position one guy to turn the bike. But uh, after the first races, then uh, we saw that's possible. Takes about <laughs> a bit longer than on another bike, but she was able to turn the bike and race it back again. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, she does a great job. And the bike itself looks great when, when she's on it. And, and with the fire uh, breathing, it's, it's probably quite intimidating for the other sprint competitors, isn't yeah, it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, she had to learn that uh, you have to calculate wind, <laughs> wind directions and wind speed if you fire it up. So one day she almost fired up her own suit. <laughs> and then, then she was a bit more uh, concerned about wind directions after that. <laughs> absolutely yeah fantastic now i've heard that the spitfire is being offered up for sale is that right that's right uh, we we stopped uh the eight mile business because uh, i mean customizing business is is the part where we have our hearts and where we can uh, uh, live and work our creativity fact is key bulk of our business comes out of the regular bmw dealership and uh, I was racing with uh, Polizia Uno as well in another uh, category. So it's just uh, too much uh, A time, B money uh, spending it uh, on that business. So we decided to stop. And um, there were more than 1,000 hours in Spitfire. Somehow a bit of it should go back. So that's why we decided to uh, Spitfire is going on sale as well as Polizia to uh, Okay, yeah. So how many uh, kilometers does Spitfire have on the clock then with all of those uh, eighth of a mile sprints and, and uh, not much in between? Yeah, guess. Uh, make a guess, Andy. I, I would say maybe less than 200. Uh, very, very good. Yeah, yeah. I think you should be a team member of ours. It's actually pretty precise, 200 kilometers on the speedo. So actually almost brand new. Yeah, just one careful uh, lady owner, so to speak. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a very old, slow-driving lady. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How much are you looking for it, Danny? How much is it uh, being sold uh, it's, for? It's a uh, five-digit number, a bit below 90,000 US dollars. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a completely unique bike, that's for sure. I'm sure there'll be lots of interest. And, and speaking of other unique bikes, I saw another bike of yours for sale too. It's a, a 1986 R65, interestingly, with a vintage fly fishing rod and an old boat paddle mounted on the side. <laughs> yeah. Now, I presume this is an ironic nod to all those custom bikes out there with the surf and the skateboard fixing. Now, you've called this one Willoughby 65, so I'm guessing there's a cool story behind this bike, Danny. Uh, actually, it is uh, because it's my private bike. So um, uh, whenever we build a bike for ourselves or for customers, we like to have a st uh, the bike to tell a story. And this uh, story is because I really love uh, 60s uh, movies with Doris Day, Rock Hudson, etc. And there's one movie uh, which I like very much. It's called uh, Men's Favorite Sports where Rock Hudson is playing uh, a fisherman's expert, writing books and giving tips, but actually never catch the fish in his whole <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in, in that movie, he's called Willoughby. So that's why the bike is called Willoughby 65. The movie was from 65. I am born in 65 and the bike is a R65. And it does have pedal and fishing rods because of of Rock Hudson, but also, as you mentioned, because at that time when we built that bike, uh, every customizer was putting surfboards or skateboards on his bike. And we say, um, we can do that different. We don't like to follow uh, the crowd. So. Understood. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic looking bike. And, and you say it's your personal bike, but I'm imagining if you put a thousand hours in, into the Spitfire, imagining, imagining you put a lot of hours into this. So is uh, some of that sort of, you know, you have to sell it because you want to keep your wife or? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just I have too less time to ride it. Uh, when I ride bikes, uh, it's usually with, with friends or with clients, so I, I, I can't take this one because of uh, reliability and noise level. <laughs> so uh, we said uh, it sits here and it has even... <laughs> 
a bit more than 200 kilometers on its speeder since uh, we rebuilt it, the bike. And uh, we've done it very fast. There, here we are again with the police story. And uh, so with, I like to have fast bikes, probably not looking fast, but are fast. So it's, uh, it has a big pocket, uh, flat slider, carburetors, uh, camshaft, digital ignition. It's really, it goes real, real uh, first gear. So it's a fast one. Um, I would like to keep it, but it doesn't make sense to just keep it here as a as a showroom uh, attraction. Yeah, no, I understand. It's uh, if, if if the listeners want to uh, read a little bit more about that bike, I think they can find out about it on the VTR customers website, can't they? Correct, and also on uh, BikeX if there's an article about the bike. Okay, yeah, good to know. And and this theme, these TV themes, film themes, it brings me nicely onto the latest R18 custom project you've working in because there's <laughs> there's definitely yeah. a film slash TV connection to there, isn't there? Wasn't Miss Fisher a detective of some sorts? Yeah, that's actually a, a TV show. Uh, Miss Fisher's Mysterious Murders, uh, playing in the late 20s, early 30s in Australia. And uh, I just, I don't know, I like to have these kind of TV shows, old movies and uh, criminal stories. I'm also a James Bond fan. Um, and looking on the uh, R18, and we uh, we didn't find the right R18 for VTR. There was a long process. The first thoughts were, let's do it in a kind of Harley style. So actually the first uh, concept was uh, Harley does have a very nice olive dark green matte color. Uh, for about three years ago, they came out with the color. That was the first uh, topic uh, or design. And then uh, Miss Fisher does have a Hispano Suiza. Uh, that's an old Swiss car brand. Uh, which is shown on the on the show, obviously. And then when I saw her driving with that car, the, the hundredth time I I almost uh, seen all the, of the of the series, I said, "That's it! It's a Swiss sauce, or it's Swiss, and it has this uh, classy old school style." And that basically that was the moment when I had the, the right concept and design in my mind, and of course the color scheme. Colors are always a very, very important topic for us. We spend a lot of time with our painter and with samples and so on. So, yeah, that was the trigger point why Miss Fisher uh, is Miss Fisher now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's a beautiful car from that series, and, and I totally understand where you, where you got the color scheme from now. How did it translate across to a bike, though? You know, you've got this beautiful four-wheel car, this beautiful detective, but how do you translate that? across the two wheels that's an interesting process we said let's do it not only classic because then it would have spoke wheels of course we said let's do a kind of mixture of modern uh, bad looking bike but also very classy and then it was very clear the the color scheme the hispano swiss from miss fisher is all black except body is uh, dark red uh, with polished alloy and then you just uh, that's <laughs> Uh, quickly say but the long job you have to find the lines then uh, on the bike that's uh, a topic we spend also a lot of time uh, together with the customization team and the painter until we got the line we've seen other r18 custom bikes and when i look to them all of them are very nice work and i really love them but i figured out that they all use the standard line for example on the gas tank this uh, hand lining which is the classy r5 design and we said let's do it different uh, we'd like to find another line I myself, I'm owning an old uh, Husqvarna motocross bike from the 80s, and that's the typical knee part of the gas tank. Uh, we make it more a bit looking like Art Deco or or speedy shape. So this is how we are working on a, a an idea to get it then on the bike. It's a long way, and a lot of samples and trying out and um, painting lines on the bike until you get the final uh, solution. And is this build, is Miss Fisher for a customer or do you prefer to build what you want and then see if it sells or how does that process work? Yeah, with brand new uh, models, uh, that's actually our preferred way. The first shot is uh, VTR custom, so no compromises and questions from any clients, just the way we'd like to build it. 
and uh, of course other bikes were built for customers with their own story and their own uh, preferences but if a model is brand new like we did on the r90 um, that's always a vtr customs owned bike and then we build it and then we we are going to sell it what were the main challenges of this build do you think and, and what are you most proud of when you see the results most proud is that we we have the design we were looking for a, a classy and a bit different look than other R18s have. Um, the biggest challenge is always if you get a new model, you have to understand the bike, what is possible with uh, and what where are the limits constructional wise. Then you have a financial target. Uh, I mean, we can build for two hundred thousand, but we'd like to sell it at the end. So these are kind of the of the challenges uh, uh, to find out. Uh, but the first uh, crucial thing for me is understand understand the R18, and that's a new customizer market. Which, for example, a multi-brand dealer who has Harley and BMW has a clear advantage because he knows exactly how all the different designs and where to get the parts and. So uh, actually, I spend about at least half a day to just find the right uh, rear fender pieces or a, a seat, where, which is for a 90, I all have them in my mind. So it takes me about 10 seconds. These were the challenges. But we're proud of the result. And uh, we and also the, the people like it. Yeah, it looks absolutely fantastic. I mean, have you got any uh, interest in it already? Or do you want to keep it in the showroom for a while? <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds stupid. But unfortunately, we have already an interest. Uh, actually, a, a customer from us, he already owns another custom bike. And I sent him some pictures, sneak previews. I told him, don't go out with them. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> And then he came to the shop and he saw the bike and, uh, yeah, can we twist the, the seat a bit higher because he has very long legs. So it looks like, as far as I know, this client uh, probably is uh, sold already. Yeah. And just going back to the uh, original or the, the standard R18 when it was originally unveiled. Now, you've already done lots of R90s, but what were your thoughts when you first saw the big box of prototypes? Were you excited about that because of the possibilities it offers you yeah very much especially uh, the engine itself that's a piece of art if you remove the engine you can put it in your in your living room as a piece of art that really i love it and it then when we start to work on the bike we figured out as our colleagues in munich they really took it serious with uh, approaching or uh, making something against harley there are pieces on that bike they are as heavy as on a harley <laughs> so we started to measure uh, some of the pieces um the the exhaust connection for example the the connection between cylinder head and downpipe we have to remove this because we'd like it of course to paint it and to have it a special design <laughs> so um, it's about almost one kilo heavy so i i can prove it's 800 grams just that connector so uh, uh i like it to have it really authentic uh and the design is uh, fabulous and you can do a lot of different shapes and design so uh, miss fisher was actually planned as our standard demo bike now uh, seeing the result i fear uh, to hand that over to every client <laughs> so we said oh shit, we can't do that <laughs> so, so we have to build the second one and now we're working on our standard demo bike which is going to be a classic we we'd like to build a classic bobber um remove all the the front uh, and the headlights but we like to have the the fat 16 tire inches um with a smaller budget and we convert it in this direction then. yeah i mean like lots of uh, customizers you'd have just taken the bike apart and stripped it right back to see what the possibilities were but yeah. in doing that do you feel that bmw has hit on a winning formula with a bike like it's r18 and it's endless scope for customization uh, definitely because it allows various uh, styles um, and it's also constructed quite nicely for us to remove and install parts and to change parts um, there's just the, the most heard comment, and probably you are familiar with that too, is if you sit the Harley rider on that bike, um, he doesn't like the boxer hinges because he can stretch uh, his leg. Uh, so it's an unusual position. Basically, I always say it's a very nice and really from 
ground up designed new uh, cruiser bike which i i really love it and also to, for customization but i think it's not that easy as we all think to get harley riders on that bike and that's why we've built miss fisher and i promise you will see that bike on every single harley event in switzerland and in europe we'd like to go out to show the harley crowd that we can build uh, different styles with that bike Fantastic. Yeah, I think it's it's just a matter of time, isn't it? And yeah. not just in Switzerland either, because I'm sure you, you've got fans and you've got customers all over the world. But actually, what is the Swiss market like, Danny? What what do the locals enjoy riding? Uh, the local, that's kind of something strange. Either it's cars or, or bikes. We have very strict rules, um, uh, speed rules. And if you get speed trapped, you, it's even possible that you're losing your vehicle so that the police is taking your bike and then it's not anymore your bike. Noise level is a challenge. But however, Swiss guys, they like to have full optional and fast bikes. <laughs> and something I learned, especially in comparison to the German markets, a Swiss uh, rider usually changes his GS every, an average every three years. Two years, Vers okay. Yeah. Two to three years, he'd like to get the new one. And uh, what I, when I look into the German markets, they usually ride the GS until she's dead. And then, yeah. she, then they change the bike. So they have more frequently and usually full optional. So they make all crosses you can. That's not a single question to not have a dynamic ASA, for example. Yeah, I think you've got a great climate and great roads, of course, in Switzerland. So do you, do you think this also determines the, the kind of bikes that are sold? Uh, yes and no. Yeah, we, have, we have windy, tiny roads just in, in front of us. So after your working hours, you can do an easy, nice one-hour ride across the mountain scenery. Uh, but at when I look to the GS Adventure, for example, I always compare that bike with the, with the SUV. So most of my adventure clients, they buy it because of the look, not because they'd like to ride the Panamericano or something like that. It's just the look. And most of the GS Adventure have never seen a dirty road. <laughs> that, that's something like I uh, compare to the X5. Uh, the X5s I was selling... Uh, probably one out of 500 have seen a dirty road. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it's it's hard to, to deny that GS Adventure looks fantastic, regardless of whether you want to uh, take it off-road, although I think we both agree it looks much better caked in mud as well, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but speaking of great-looking bikes, I mean, obviously we've seen plenty of really nice classic boxes and R9T builds coming out of the VTR garage over the years, and, and now this R18, Miss Fisher, of course, but you also took on the challenge of uh, S-Series custom builds in the past. They can't have been easy at all. I mean, I'm guessing that the 1000cc four-cylinder platform doesn't offer customizers like yourself such an easy ride, does it? Yeah, yeah, that's true. We uh, we are known for all these 90 and probably for the 212 boxes, but it's always kind of a, a challenge for us our, ourselves. We we'd like to do things different, and then we said, well, we never customized a four-cylinder unless a little bit of painting and a little bit of exhaust. And that's uh, that was the reason why we have two years ago we had an S one thousand RR customized and an S one thousand XR uh, customized, which uh, I liked the aggressive, sporty look. And and again, they all they always have kind of a story of ourselves. So the the XR is is kind of a supermoto uh, race bike, but with four cylinders. Um, yeah, and we will continue to customize bikes you usually don't see customized too much. Yeah, those bikes certainly look fantastic. I bet they sold quickly, didn't they? Yep, they, they sold quickly, yeah. And is it true that you guarantee to your customers to never build the same bike twice, you know, so what they have will always be a one-of-a-kind machine? 
That's true, actually. Um, and I have a lot of mails uh, asking me, I would like to have a Shitone 61, one-on-one, -on -one, the same bike, what's the price, when deliver? Uh, and our standard answer is that's a, a client promise. They are all one-offs. I can build bikes in uh, with a similar concept, but different details or different paint scheme, but one-on-one -on -one copies are not doable for us. Actually, I just had today a mail from a German client or customer interested in Miss Fisher, he'd like to have his R18 converted into Miss Fisher, said we can do similar styles or color schemes, but it's one-off. Uh, saying that, we also uh, invented or invented, we introduced a flat rate customizing concept to our customers because the key challenge is always um, you see an, an R90 owner, he sees our websites and then he comes into the shop and says, I would like to have this like sheet on and the front like this and, and so I make notes and at the end I say, yeah, we're speaking about 30,000 Swiss francs conversion costs and then it's silent and then um, yeah, okay, well, so we changed the concept to be quicker and more efficient. We said there are three packages, small, medium, large. We offer that on R90 Pure, Classic and Scrambler. And the, the client sees what he gets and he has his own decision on the color scheme, on the seat cover, but all the rest is in this package. He can add on if he like. If he says, it, I'd like to have a special wheel set, that's doable as well. But uh, going that road, people now really like to see, uh, to buy what they see. That's an old uh, selling uh, rule. So every year we build three new flat rate bikes without on any customer behind to see, to show the people what, what they can do and what we can do for 4,800, for 7,000 or for 15,000 Swiss francs. And that changed the game. And this, that's the only piece where we say we do copies one on one because I sold the uh, 90 pure super S probably three or four times the same bike. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for for those who really do want to or one of a kind machine, it's it's good that you make that promise. But yeah, certainly a a price matrix m makes a lot of sense as well. But speaking of one of a kinds, what was the thinking behind making a VTR custom G three hundred and ten GS? A our apprenticeship and B in switzerland we discussed about engine power for <laughs> for uh, switzerland the g310 is not our top selling bag so to speak <laughs> and so we said that that's a shame so let's build a cool and nice bike out of this uh, g310 and this is what we've done um to don't make it too costly we have uh, said that that's our apprenticeship project so here's your bike <laughs> here's your budget and then we we exchanged some ideas um, and then uh, that's how the G310 GS uh, came on the road. Fantastic. Yeah, what a great project for an apprentice to uh, yep. sink his or her teeth into as well. And that's one thing that perhaps I, I haven't sort of made clear enough. It's not just you, is it? I mean, you've got a whole team of specialists at VTR Customs. But what about people listening today who don't have all those years of engineering or building experience that, you know, they're just BMW fans who want to experiment with the first ever build? Where, where's the starting point for them, Danny? Can you still find an old air-cooled boxer bike at a decent price or should they be looking elsewhere? What advice can you give? Actually, when, when we look for uh, two valve boxes, we have a, a, a stock on old bikes. And I always say to the customers, I looked, we were looking for the ugliest uh, two valve boxes. So the one you said, ah, that's a crap. So that's the bike we are looking for. Uh, we measure uh, the engine compression, if the, is the engine okay? And all the rest is kind of... Uh, all the rest gets taken off yeah <laughs> yeah and and so that's what how we are looking for our bikes now if you are a private uh, guy who'd like to have his own garage built that's of course a bit different i would rather uh, recommend to look some uh, for a, a two valve boxer who is already a bit customized in the direction i'd like and then to make it out of that one my personal piece and especially in Switzerland, uh, you must really take care that all this uh, customization is street legal. So uh, you have to be very sure that you buy a bike which is all customized but street legal. If not, you've got uh, bigger challenges and, uh, and expenses there. 
uh, say the customer is myself, Danny, and, and uh, I've uh, had a good year. I've worked hard. I've got a little bit of uh, money saved up, and and I've got an idea in my head for a build. And let's say, let's just say for argument's sake that it's the R18. If I've got my bike and I've got a budget of, for example, ten thousand Swiss francs, which I think is about eight or nine thousand euros. What are you able to give me for that and how long is it going to take before it's ready, assuming that you've got a lot of the other work out of the way first? And I want it as soon as possible, by the way, because summer's coming in Europe. You must be a new customer because usually they wait two years. They say, no, 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 let's give it time. No, no, I'm just kidding. So the process is basically pretty much the same if it's a 90 or, or something else. I always ask the client, he should bring me pictures from bikes or from details he, he loved uh, very much. Uh, uh, this tail, this color scheme, I like this front, I like the handlebar, I like these electrical switches, uh, blah, blah, blah. So I can A, judge, is this possible street legal? That's question number one in Switzerland. And then we speak about budgets. Beside these pictures, I always ask the client to tell me a little bit of his background. Why is this bike so important uh, to him? Is there a special story behind and does he already have a name for the bike? So uh, this is something, um, A, we do for ourselves, but uh, B, my experience is only then when you get all this uh, background information, you are able to produce the bike um, the client wants to. And then after exchanging stories and background information and uh, pictures, second uh, stop point is uh, budget. <laughs> Then uh, we're speaking figures, I make a concrete offer. Sometimes then we start uh, adding some red uh, <laughs> markers uh, to reduce the budget. And then from there, we're going on to produce the bike. And while producing it, uh, we call the client at least uh, two times uh, to get the detailed decisions. When we start to paint or we do the upholster, we'd like really to have the client on the bike to show him different lines, different colors and different letters and so on. So he's kind of part of that process. Sometimes it's really creative and sometimes we are going to exceed what we've uh, decided or uh, budgeted at the first time. Um, whenever the bike is finished, he will see on his invoice, uh, red is adding <laughs> and uh, green is removing from his budget. So he has a clear overview. But it's about pictures, street legal, budget and personal stories. Why is this bike should that bike look like that and what is the story behind and do most people have a clear idea a clear picture in their head of, of what they're looking for in terms of a finished product or, or are they happy to be guided by you and your team through that journey that's very uh very different i do have client they say look that's okay this that's the budget um uh color should be green um do it you have a, a nice style let's do it i full trust you do whatever you like call me up in two months, I will get it. All the clients, they discuss with you every single detail, every electrical switch, every wiring. So um, sometimes it's a challenge to handle all these uh, different clients, but that's part of the process. Finally, we built their dream bike and it should look like they wanted to have it. And the best moment for me is if I uh, unveil the final custom bike. I just delivered last Saturday a 90 uh, customized for about 20,000 Swissies. And uh, you will never forget the faces of your clients when you unveil the bike. Is it sometimes, I mean, is it a nervous time for you when you're going to deliver a bike? Because, you know, I'm assuming that 99% of the time people are really happy and overjoyed, but it can go the other way, I guess. Up until now, we were happy. <laughs> of course, you, you have some details. Clients said, yeah, but well, I'd like to have these foot pegs a little bit different and, and uh, the lettering is not the way I wanted uh, some details. But overall, if you're doing a good job, you pretty much will match the experience and uh, the customer's need. Yeah, I could see how uh, it can become quite addictive, actually, getting yeah. an idea in your head of the bike you want. And uh, I'm sure that uh, once people have one bike done, uh, they, they end up being repeat customers and come to you time and time again. 
Yeah, or sending me uh, customers as well. That's also something we experience that we build a bike for them. And then a friend of them is having a triumph and like to change to also a 90 and then they show up in the store again. Uh, and then we do his friend's custom bike as well. So it's people to people marketing. Yeah, that's the best way. That's the way it yeah, should always be if possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good advice there. Thanks, Danny. So what future projects have you got in the pipeline then? Uh, first, <laughs> finish all customer <laughs> projects, which is a challenge. It's springtime already, so we have to deliver new bikes. The workshop is full, and I have uh, another, I think, left always uh, 10 or 15 projects. In total, we had 30 projects to finish. Uh, and and then uh, it's in the in the high season, we usually build more from this flat rate customization. I have one bigger or 18 project from a customer. He uh, already have a 90 from us and uh, he's a crazy gearhead like we are and uh, cost limits is the sky. <laughs> so this is going to be really uh, crazy and bad uh, or 18, but it will take us till end of the year until we see some pictures from that bike. Yeah, but clearly you can uh, let your imagination run wild on that one. And uh, yeah, sounds like you've been very creative during the lockdown and, and very busy as well. So, uh, Danny, that's all we've got time for today. It's been a real pleasure having you as a guest on Ride and Talk. And, and I've really enjoyed learning more about the wonderful world of VTR Custom. And so thanks ever so much for your time. And I really hope to catch up with you in person before too long at a real motorcycle show, not a virtual one. And the real beer or whiskey and the real cigar. That's something I owe you uh, promised here by your Swiss gentleman. <laughs> I'll hold you to that, Danny. Thank <laughs> you very right. much for today. Take care, my friend. Okay. <laughs> you too. Thanks, Andy. Cheers, Danny. That was a great chat. Now I'm definitely going to hunt for an old air-cooled boxer, one of the ugly ones, as you put it, that I can remove all the plastic, take a good look at what's underneath, and then let my imagination run wild in the hope of creating something special and unique for me, of course. Or maybe find one of the nicer ones and restore it to its original glory. Either way, I'm looking forward to getting my hands dirty and I might just be calling you once or twice for some well-needed advice. That'll be a project for next winter, though, because with summer on its way in Europe, there's a lot of riding to be done. Anyway, take care and stay safe out there, everybody. Bye for now.